themselves, themselves and the use of gloves uh, for the administration of COVID-19 uh, is not recommended when the skin is intact. Uh, WHO still continues to advise the use of face shield as a rational when it is necessary to add a protective layer to add a spirit that is not to protect the use. For environmental cleaning, we talk about the president of the cleaning and disinfection, easily and flat touch to minimize the surfaces should be easily cleaned and minimize. And also looking at the evidence of having well. So for um, for the aerosol generating pro procedures, what we are recommending is the new certified N95, N99, or the US FDA approved N95, as well as the EU standard um, FFP2 or FFP3 for the equivalent. If there are concerns regarding the certification of the N95 mask that is in use, we recommend that uh, as well as you, you share with us the issue. Fitting is also um, recommended. Fitting is also recommended. Fitting is also recommended. Fitting testing is also recommended. And uh, if this is not possible, and uh, then then we need to look to ensure that we have a tight seal of them. Um, and in T5, fitting testing is also recommended. And, uh, so the issue of double masking, uh, what WHO is recommended is that um, we look into the issues of improved fitting and filtration, as well as uh, uh, the uh, breathability of the wearer and the potential uh, higher risk of self-contamination. But currently there is not um, um, there's need for more evidence uh, to look into the issue of uh, double masking. So for the isolation and the cohort um, areas, we still um, encourage that uh, healthcare workers uh, that are we need, there's need for designating a dedicated group of healthcare workers in the isolation area and really restrict the number of healthcare work working in this area. There's also need to improve ventilation in the area and uh, look into uh, cohorting patients who are who have COVID-19 confirmed cases. Um, together, and also the ones who are suspected uh, together. So, uh, regarding contact and droplet precaution, uh, we encourage the, the the performance of hand hygiene before and putting on um, uh, PPEs and the, the use of appropriate PPEs. 
And then we, for extended use of masks, respirators, gowns, and eye protection, uh, it can be applied during the care of COVID-19 patients in the context of a PPE shortage. So for airborne precaution, I think we've talked about this, that we need to use uh, certified um, respirators for, for uh, aerosol generating procedures and um, airborne precaution. And let us remember of the WHO list of um, AGPs and also oral health care, like uh, the use of spring generating equipment and also an aerosol generating procedure. So this need for using the respirators um, with this. The issue of exhalation valves uh, is still discouraged, and this is because there's ineffective uh, source control. So for healthcare worker infection, what we're encouraging adequate training, uh, improving uh, patient to staff ratio, uh, active syndromic uh, surveillance, uh, as well as passive surveillance, uh, seeking medical care early for healthcare workers and compliance to standard as well as uh, standard precautions as well as uh, uh, additional precautions. Universal masking for us who are in uh, community transmission is also um, encouraged. So for administrative uh, measures, we need to limit access to visitors and uh, look for other alternatives for visitation, such as uh, telemedicine, and also restrict movement in the healthcare facilities, have a single visitor or designate an entrance for, for the visitors. There's need to keep a record of all the visitors that are coming into a facility. For ventilation, we the three basic criteria need to be looked into, the ventilation rate, airflow direction, as well as air distribution or pattern, and uh, the three methods which are of ventilation, which are natural, mechanical, and hybrid ventilation uh, can be utilized in the healthcare facility. For specimen col collection, it still remains the same. There is need for use for appropriate PPEs and uh, airborne precaution needs to be taken into consideration when one is doing an esophageal aspirate, sputum, tracheal aspirate, bronchial viola uh, lavage, or a pleural fluid. And uh, there is need for the um, technicians or the personnel to, to be trained in safe handling practices and uh, spill decontamination procedures. Surgical uh, procedures, we still recommend that um, we oper um, the decision to operate is really based on the need of the, the need, that is the risk versus the benefit of the surgery. Um, and not only just the COVID status of the patient. So we need to also remember that post-operatively there are pulmonary complications that, that can occur and this also needs to be weighed. Uh, but we need to look at uh, the standard precautions uh, during uh, surgical procedures, as well as uh, look into other non-surgical alternatives if they are possible uh, for the patient. Uh, postponement of elective surgery can also be considered um, for patients who are stable. And um, if we cannot postpone it, then a careful risk assessment needs uh, to be done. Uh, and also uh, molecular testing or, uh, uh, you know, for, for the patients who are going into surgery, if um, the healthcare facility has put that into consideration. So um, while uh, before and during surgery, there's need to look into the contact and droplet precautions. And if it's possible, then a negative pressure room is what is recommended during anesthesia and intubation. For the outpatient, it still remains the same, that there's need for IPC implementation of IPC minimum requirement uh, as a baseline. Uh, the use of telemedicine can be used in the outpatient, screening and early recognition, as well as the um, contact and uh, droplet precautions. For vaccination, um, I think we have shared the WHO aid memoir for uh, IPC in vaccination. So there's need to look into IPC during vaccinations, uh, both the standard precaution as well as the additional precautions that include uh, mask use. As I say, monitoring and evaluation is very important, uh, looking into the key performance um, indicators that are, are recommended uh, by WHO. So we are encouraging that uh, this also be utilized um, in the setting. Uh, thank you. That is it from
Thank you very much, Dr. Deborah. Um, and I want to thank you for the whole presentation with all the information. I'm just going to ask if we can take just two minutes break for the interpreters to catch their breath before we hand over to Prof. Shaheen. Um, it's been quite a lengthy one and I know they had to keep up. So if we can just give them two minutes uh, and in the interim, if you guys can just all leave your questions and answers in the Q&A box and we will take it from there. I see a lot of people still put their questions in the chat box. Please put it in the Q&A box and we will take it from there. So just two minutes break for the interpreters and then we'll start with Prof. Shaheen. Thank you. Can I leave my uh, share screen on? Prof, you can leave it on, that's fine. Thank you. Anna, do you um, think we're ready? Yes, Prof, I think we can start. So um, I'm just going to hand over to Prof Shaheen Mehta. I think she's been a person that everybody knows, but Prof Shaheen Mehta is also the founder member of ICANN. She's also an infection prevention specialist, and she serves on a lot of um, very highly powered boards and, and platforms. So I'm going to hand over to Prof to tell us, take us through the vaccine presentation. Thank you, Prof, over. Thank you very much. And I thank all of you for the invitation. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I see there's a very large uh, uh, um, participant group, which is wonderful. Uh, and I think the reason is because uh, this to topic on vaccination is been, has been very, very controversial. So if I may, um, I think you can probably see my screen, but I think uh, I will actually um, stop my video because it will take away from the bandwidth. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, some of the initial information regarding the vaccine was uh, has been taken from an excellent lecture by Dr. Yanki Taliad, uh, who's infectious diseases uh, specialist at uh, Stellenbosch and Tigerberg Hospital. And I think many of the points that he addresses, I hope, will be able to 
help you to think through what's going on. I have then added a few more aspects, which I hope will make it clearer to you um, as to why vaccination is important. So let's see how we go. So uh, uh, because there are so many various questions and there's so much hesitancy and concern, I thought I'd divide the talk up in a way where you can look at why the vaccination happened, you can look at uh, the development of the vaccine, look at the scientific um, basis of the development, and then what's going on at the moment with some of the more frequently asked questions. So the first question that everybody wants to know, um, and this is, uh, of course, part of the issue around the anti-vaxxers, as well as those with vaccine hesitancy, is why are we vaccinating? But what we know over the years, um, and this is since the, the uh, late uh, 1900s, is that it is a very effective public health measure, and it has saved millions and millions of lives. And for those of you that are too young to remember, polio used to be a major issue, which has now been eradicated. And some of us are old enough to remember being vaccinated by smallpox, which none of the young people would now have marks on their arms for. So in fact, it is a very, very effective way of public health measure. Successfully, what have we managed so far? Well, we all know about the childhood vaccination with BCG, polio, hepatitis B, et cetera, diphtheria, tetanus, and so on. And now moving on, of course, to the HPV and the pneumococcus vaccine that has been delivered, that has been delivered to childhood. So there's no doubt in anybody's mind that vaccines for children is actually effective. Um, there's also the availability of vaccines after injuries, such as tetanus and rabies. And then when we travel, if we go anywhere around Africa, we get yellow fever vaccine, some people get hepatitis A vaccine, um, and some people get a meningococcal vaccine. Now, the, the, we don't question any of this. We have not questioned this. We have never questioned this. And very clearly, when you go into a country, uh, if you haven't had your yellow fever vaccine, they'll you know, put you back well, on the next plane back home. So there has also been very recently even more developments looking at Ebola and meningitis. We're trying to control the outbreak. Now, for those of us that were involved in the Ebola outbreak in 2014 to 2016, unfortunately, by the time the Ebola vaccine came around, the, um, the pandemic or the epidemic had, had, been, had decreased, but it was still offered and delivered to many people. Okay, so the... Why, what is the story with this COVID vaccine? Why is there so much uh, controversy around it? And the status is that we know it's a deadly, deadly pandemic. We've just heard from Dr. Uh, Elimi about how extensively this thing has spread, not only across the globe, but particularly in Africa. We also know that there are no current preventative or curative therapies. If you get COVID, you actually get COVID. Um, and you do land up in, in, in hospital sometimes if you're not being vaccinated and people die. Uh, there has been some purported um, um, medication like ivermectin, which of course is not based in any evidence whatsoever. Uh, however, there's nothing much that we can do about it once you get it. And of course, there's an economic and social catastrophe. Um, and I can assure you that in Africa, this is really, really, very visible. Vaccination is a, has got a promising approach for curbing the epidemic. And individually, it will prevent deaths, it'll prevent hospitalization, and I'll show you some data on that. We'll restore access to clinic and hospitals, which currently are being used only for COVID. And many, as we've heard earlier from, the, from Deborah, uh, we, are, we are not doing any, or many countries are not doing uh, elective surgery. They're only doing emergency surgery. Um, and to restore the freedom of movement and economic uh, engagement. Uh, and this is not that this has been exemplified by what's happening in the UK, where they call the 16th the Freedom Day, where everybody could take off their masks because they had reached 85% vaccination in the country and you could run around and do what you liked. Not that the scientists approved, but Boris Johnson thought it was a really good idea. So that is something that we have to think about as well. The advantage to population is because of, it decreases transmission. So what we do know about the vaccine is that if you've had the vaccine, the amount, the viral load, which was being referred to by Deborah earlier, is, is dramatically reduced. And it is considered that in some situations it is reduced by 90%. Okay. Um, because this transmission is reduced and people are vaccinated, there's a reasonable chance of community or herd immunity. 
there's a decreased additional COVID burden on the health system, which is reduced. Uh, you can start traveling again. Some of you who want to go and see your loved ones in their various parts of the world uh, would be allowed to do so. Uh, for example, my family is in, in, is in the UK. I haven't seen them for two and a half, three years because South Africa is on the red list. And um, now, even though I've been vaccinated, um, I'm not sure that they would allow me to go. And most importantly, it's the opening of local and international economies. Very, very important. We have people, up to 4 million people in South Africa today who do not have a means of earning a living because of the various issues that have arisen through COVID. And so without a vaccine, there's always a risk of new outbreaks that, that will emerge. And this is true, as we've seen, with the emergence of the alpha, the, 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 the beta, the gamma, and then now the delta variant, and possibly of the lambda variant. And this is the only safe route back to normality. The, one of the questions in your chat box was, um, does this protect against variants? And I shall address that. Now, the one question that has arisen that I don't trust this vaccine because it has been done so quickly. Everything happened so fast. What is going on? No, 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 there's something wrong. So I just want to show you what's been going on over here. This is the normal run of developing traditionally a vaccine, which takes 15 years or more. So there's a preclinical, pre which takes two to four years. There is the clinical trial in the phase one where a small number of humans are, in the, uh, are, are given the vaccine and safety is checked, the immune response is checked. And then there's phase two where the human numbers in increase and safety goes up and looking again at more safety and more safety with the immune response. Then you have a phase three where you have increased numbers and there's a vast amount of people being vaccinated. Look at efficacy now as well as safety. And then the vaccine is registered, as you know, and it is produced. Okay, so what happens now? Why was the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine unprecedentedly uh, accelerated? The reasons are this. We had very earlier on, within a week of the virus being isolated, a full genome sequencing and modern vaccine platforms. And don't forget, everybody in the world who had any means of producing the vaccine had actually come along to, to help out. So the, there was a global, if you like, uh, 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 camaraderie about getting a vaccine. The other point was that there was already pre-existing vaccine development for SARS-CoV-1, which happened in Hong Kong, and MERS-CoV, which happened in the Middle East. So there was already a precedented system that was going on. The third thing was that there was an ability now to be able to overlap clinical phases and reduce the amount of years or time that one needed and because there was regulatory urgency, emergency registrations were being were taking place in, in the UK, in Europe, in the, in the United States, and even in South Africa. Okay, And because there was a multi-sectoral effort for funding, a lot of money, a huge amount of money was being put towards it. Okay. However, despite all this, the safety criteria were unchanged. All right. So the fast tracking of the SARS-CoV virus went from the design where they actually had the pre-existing SARS-CoV and, and the MERS-CoV. They went into the pre-existing uh, uh, development already. They submitted and then they overlapped the clinical phases over here. They went into production. They did the BLA, which was submitted, and then they managed to get it out in 10 months to a year. Um, and this was actually unprecedented. And I'm sure in the future, we will find that this will become more and more easy to do because of what has happened. So that was why the vaccine was fast tracked. The scientific basis for developing the vaccine was quite clear. The, so the, the spike protein, which you can see here as a black uh, uh, um, genome, um, is, of course, the one that is going to be the main target for the vaccine development. And this was based on the central role it played in the process of infection, which had already been identified in China and in, the, uh, and in Europe as being the point that you had to look at as far as the main target for the vaccine development. We looked at the antigenic, uh, the, and so what was interesting is that the antigenic target for both SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV vaccines were there and the safety and immunity response had already happened. So the observations that antibodies bind to the spike protein prevent attachment and neutralization of the virus. And all this antigenic target is the one that gave us the ability to move forward in a rapid way. So the next question is, oh no, we can't have that. So I'm not going into the 5G story because I think all of you are far too intelligent to insult your intelligence by even mentioning it. 
However, there was another story about can vaccine change your DNA? Well, this is the mRNA vaccine, which we will, of course, as you all know, these are the ones like the Pfizer and the Moderna, uh, and then the vac vector vi viruses, uh, sorry, viral vector vaccines are J&J &J and adenovirus, okay. So here comes the uh, RNA, it goes in, and all it does is teaches the host cell, the, 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 the cell, to produce more RNA, okay. And this one, of course, is a vaccine which is loaded on an adenovirus, which is a very normal, neutral, co common garden adenovirus, which then will go away and produce vaccine for you. So none of the vaccines integrate into the human DNA because they haven't got that ability. It is an RNA virus, okay? So the mRNA and the vectors are destroyed by normal cellular function as soon after the expression of the spike proteins. And it is very important to remember. So this is the reply, which was a really good paper published by the CDC uh, on um, when there was so much vaccine hesitancy. And the explanation is quite clear. As I've just mentioned, the Moderna, the, the Moderna and the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, they do not contain live virus that cause the COVID and therefore cannot give anybody COVID. They don't interact with the human DNA, okay? J and J um, and and uh, and uh, the Africa's uh, the AstraZeneca vaccines are viral vector vaccines, which means they use modified version of a different virus to deliver important instruction. Vaccines that use the same viral vector have been given to pregnant women in the third trimester of pregnancy. Uh, this was during a large scale Ebola vaccination trial, and nothing has happened from there. There's no adverse pregnancy-related outcome, uh, including adverse uh, 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 outcomes to the infant, and I will show you some data on that, okay? So I think it's really quite important to understand that this was a myth, not a reality. So how long do the vaccines work? Well, it's not known, but there are no boosters organized for now, but there may be some later. How about the vaccine long-term efficacy? Well, thus far we know uh, there are only months follow up, but there's a possibility about the safety so far, and I'll talk to you about that. But boosters can happen if mutations continue. Um, and severe reactions typically uh, occur within days or weeks, but long term side effects can happen, and that's rare. Post licentious surveillance and reporting remains essential, obviously. Can children receive vaccine? And the answer is that the uh, only once the safety immunology and the, uh, and the immunogenicity has been studied. However, there is now a, 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 a possibility that children in the United States and in Israel will be vaccinated if they're under the age of 12, because every time they go back to school, there's a huge outbreak. So there are studies underway vaccinating children. And so far, there doesn't seem to be any adverse report. Can immunocompromised people receive vaccines? So they, you have to measure up the increased risk of severe COVID. Um, and if that is so, then you can actually give them the vaccine. The challenging to estimate efficacy, many clinical trials don't include immunocompromised patient people for, no, for, for obvious reasons. They use healthy people. But thus far, there is nothing that says that immunocompromised people cannot get the COVID vaccine bearing in mind that the severity of the disease will far outweigh the, the outcome of uncertainties. And this was a question that came in on the chat line, which I would like to answer here, that should a person that's been diagnosed with COVID receive a vaccine? And this has happened very commonly in South Africa recently. Um, and there are many people who have actually, obviously, as you know, we've had a huge third wave by, because of the Delta variant. So um, natural immunity is not durable and reinfections can happen. And uh, we've seen reports of two of people getting infected by two different strains, either at the same time or two continuous strains, one after the other, not, uh, not the least of which was the Olympic um, swimming champion that we saw yesterday. So you wait while recovery happens. And what we are saying at the moment is that if you have after recovered from COVID, within you can take your vaccine after 30 days. And I have advised this to members of my family as well. So can pregnant women um, and breastfeeding women uh, get immunized? And particularly important for healthcare workers, of course. So in the early vaccine trials, it was not available, but I know now that I've just added the data that you can, after the first trimester of pregnancy, you can be vaccinated because there was no safety concerns during phase one, and there was no theoretical reason why the vaccine would be harmful. 
So the other one was that, can I use it as a prophylactic? In other words, if a person has been exposed, can we give them a COVID-19 vaccine to prevent disease? And the answer is that there's no data at the moment for post-exposure prophylaxis, okay? And I think it's really important that we don't consider this at that, at that level till we get more data. Uh, there's also good evidence that because the incubation period of SARS is around five days, it is unlikely that the vaccine will give them immunity quickly enough to prevent the problem. Okay, and after high risk of exposure, a complete uh, you need a complete you need to complete your ten day quarantine before undergoing immunization. So those are the two areas that you need to think about: thirty days after infection and at least ten days after high risk exposure. Okay. So this is the paper that I wanted to show you, which was published in April in JAMA. Should breastfeeding mothers get vaccinated? Okay, and this is really quite a lovely paper, really well uh, written, which then summarized, says that the anti uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific IgA antibodies, these are the ones that are present, of course, in breast milk, as we all know, are significantly elevated at two weeks after the first vaccine, when 69 or 62% of the samples tested positive, and it increased to 86% at the end of week four. And that is what they show you over here. So here's the first vaccine dose, up it goes, and then here we are with the second vaccine dose. Absolutely brilliant. It gives very good protection. The mean levels remained elevated for, uh, for during follow-up, and at week six, which is here, uh, 67, uh, so 66% of the samples tested positive. So that's really, really good news. The second thing was that anti um, SARS CoV 2 specific IgG antibody remained low for the first three weeks, okay, after the first dose, as you'd expect. But then you actually managed to get a 92% elevation of samples positive, increasing to 97%. So in breastfeeding mothers, this is a very good idea that not only in the breast milk, but also in the blood of the woman. Now, these, they, I just wanted to mention some related advisories from South Africa, that if an individual is known to have had SARS-CoV-2, uh, we are now looking at 30 days as advised, uh, mainly by the WHO, but by other organizations as well. Vaccinations for 35, and you know, that starting in September, and I think after that, we'll roll it out to everybody. Healthcare workers are being vaccinated rapidly, teachers and service delivery are being vaccinated rapidly. And so far, 6.7 million doses have been administered. Okay, I don't want to go into this, um, but just to say that we are allowing in South Africa pregnancy uh, women after, pregnant women after the first trimester. So what is the short-term safety? Overall, the current vaccines are safe. We know about the pain, the fever, the muscle ache, the, the allergy. The new vaccine safety has been the spotlight for some time and there are rare events that amplify uh, attention and anxiety, okay. But the perspective is that the risks are far lower, it is far lower than getting sick with COVID and landing up in hospital, okay. So it's really, really important to understand that. So long-term side effects, okay. The case studies show that, now this is something that happened uh, in February this year. A prothrombotic, syndrome was observed in a small number of individuals who got the AstraZeneca, which is the adenovirus um, vector-based vaccine, okay? And then subsequently they found a small number also received the J&J vaccine, which is an adenoviral vector. So what it appeared was that this thing, which is known as the vaccine-induced thrombo immune uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, um, vaccine-induced immune thrombi thrombotic thrombocytopenia was associated with the two vaccines that were adenovirals, okay, vector-based. It was also called lots of other names and is known as VITT. It is very, very rare, okay, and I'll show you some data about that now. The two vaccines, as I mentioned, was AstraZeneca and the J&J vaccine, which I had, I had the J&J vaccine. Um, and another adenoviral vaccine, which is administered now, they're looking at examples of the CanSino and then the Sputnik vaccine. VITT has not been reported from the mRNA-based vaccines such as Pfizer or Moderna, all right? The risk of the, uh, of the um, uh, adenovirus vector-based vaccines, depending on studies from Norway, or you're looking at the American study, or you're looking at studies out of, uh, out of the Far East, 
range from one in 70,000 to one in 700,000 vaccinated people. It affected mainly young women below the age of 79. Very few men were affected by it. There was a mortality associated with it, okay, because of the cavernous sinus and the cerebral sinus thrombosis. So AstraZeneca, of course, we're not gonna let this pass. And so they came back with this document, which I want you to just note. They looked at the number of deaths prevented, first of all. So the cases of COVID-19 deaths prevented. So in between the ages of 20 and 29, they had blood clots in 1.9. 30 to 39, there were two cases, 1.8. 40 to 49, there was 2.1, and in 50 to 59, 1.1, and 69, up to 69, there was one, and 70 to 79, there was 0.5, and thank God that was me from 70 to 79, and above that, there was none. So really what they said, what they show, what they were trying to talk about was that the deaths that were prevented were being prevented in those which had the lowest risk of getting the, the, the VITT or um, the problem, as you can see down here. Now, the second thing that they showed in the same paper was that the number of cases that were admitted to the um, intensive care unit, again, using the same blood clot as I showed you with platelets, and they showed that in the highest group there was the admissions prevented was, it was with the 80-year-olds. And most importantly, I think, was that the um, hospitalization, low infection rates prevented. And you can see over here that there was a huge impact on the elderly, as we know. Okay, So this was just weighing up the benefits and the harms on the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was the AstraZeneca response to what, what we were talking about just now. Nonetheless, this risk exists. It exists in the, lower, in, in the lower age group, and we have to be careful. It usually happens within the first two weeks or so, but it is um, the, uh, the, the um, data shows that it could be anything up to 28 days, okay? So I think that's really important to understand. Now, here's the J&J &J vaccine, which is widely given to all the healthcare workers, or as many healthcare workers as possible in South Africa. It was part of the Sasonke study run by the MRC, um, and, it was, and the question was, how did it do? Um, and I'm sorry, this is probably very difficult and a very busy slide to read, but basically I will summarize it here for you to say that even though we had the variant at the time, now known as the beta variant, which was present at the time of the study, the vaccine efficacy was 64% against moderate disease and 82% against severe and critical disease a one month after vaccination. So in other words, it was really good to see um, that we prevented healthcare workers from being either getting severe disease, hospitalized, intensive care, or mortality. And I think that in itself speaks more volumes for us. So the vaccine efficacy from Pfizer, so following the second dose, they got 80%, which is significantly higher than if you only had one dose, which was more than 21 days previously, okay? The benefits associated with vaccination was much greater if your CT, uh, which was greater than 30, which is the evidence of high viral shed, compared with the CT value of less than 30. All right. Vaccination effort effectiveness against testing positive with the CT value of less than 30 was estimated to be 91%, um, which was an, uh, which was which was a post second dose. So this is good news. Okay. The J and J vaccine was effective as a single dose. And this is just showing you the data from Israel, which I'm not going to go into detail, that 14 days up to 20 days, 46%, and at seven days after second dose, 92%. Symptomatic people were 80, 94% after second dose, severe COVID, 92%, and there was no death recorded. So it's, it's, a, it's a good evidence base that was given there. Now, the other thing that, of course, is worrying all of us is what's going on with the healthcare workers and reduce sensitivity to the variants, particularly the Delta variant that everybody's petrified of. Okay, so what happens here is that we're looking at the whether these vaccines work against Delta. And the summary of this wonderful paper from Nature is that looking at the reduced sensitivity to antibody neutralization is that a much better response to two doses showed a, a response to Delta, but the Tita was three to five times lower than against Alpha, but it's still neutralized effectively. Okay, so the paper, of course, this was the, this was the, 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 the sort of summary of it. 
unvaccinated healthcare workers who are hesitant or who don't want to appear to have less protection against the Delta and the Beta variants compared with the Alpha about a year after they recovered from mild COVID. While 88% of this group had neutralized antibodies against Alpha, 47%, which is about half of them, neutralized Delta. So these are unvaccinated. However, if you had recovered healthcare workers who received even one dose of a vaccine, they had a marked increased neutralizing antibody levels against all three of the variants compared with their unvaccinated peers. Now, if this paper from, from uh, uh, Nature doesn't convince you to go and get vaccinated, I don't know what will. Now, the herd immunity story uh, is that this is, of course, part of vaccine hesitancy is a major obstacle to achieving broad vaccination coverage. And, I, and the population that vaccinated will depend upon the RO, which you all know, which is about 2 to 3.5 and the efficacy of the vaccine. And of course, it is estimated that we need about 70 percent, 75 percent. So this, this shows you what, uh, by, uh, in a diagram, uh, which I took from uh, Dr. Talyard's talk, is here's the transmission. Here's your infection, your source person infecting un unvaccinated people. And no doubt it goes on and on and on, as you can see. Here is a person, and they are now transmitting to the not vaccinated people. There's little or no, none going on. Um, and of course, this is the immune group and this is the susceptible group. And I can tell you without you having, I mean, I don't have to go into details to show you, but there you can see very clearly that if there is no, no immunization, there's a problem. It is not to say that your public health measures will not remain in place. They must remain in place because what the, what the vaccine does is it reduces the viral load, but it doesn't actually stop transmission. It also, by reducing the viral load, will reduce the amount of disease that will be caused in the person, okay? And this is a lovely paper published from the United Kingdom, which was in the correspondence, and the main paper is coming out shortly, where it showed that if you've got a household contact and secondary cases, if you've got one person that's been vaccinated. So if they're not being vaccinated before tested of the index patient, this is the household contact, a huge, huge study, almost a million. Um, secondary cases was about 10%. If they were vaccinated with less than 21 days before testing positive, then that incidence went down to 5.7%. And if they were vaccinated, um, uh, uh, sorry, with the other vaccine, which is well, one is AstraZeneca, the other one is Pfizer, this one being Pfizer, then of course it went down to 6.2%. And basically what it tells you is that there is a massive reduction. You can see the odds ratio of a secondary infection here being 0.5. So it was excellent to show that transmission. And in fact, one of the papers I read very recently told uh, reported that there was an 87 to 90% reduction in household contact transmission. So this is really to you, to plead to you, please look after your family and, your, and, and people around you. And this is the rest of the paper where it shows the likelihood being uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent lower for the for those that have been vaccinated 21 days. And of course, here you can see it where the days vaccinated before positive test. One is with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, which is in blue, and the other one is the Pfizer vaccine, which is in red. And you can see quite clearly the the, the neutralizing antibodies are fantastic. Okay, so that's one way of saving the family if you're worried about them. So the approach to vaccine hesitancy, I don't want to go into details because there are two types. One where the anti-vaxxers are really can't be bothered to take the vaccine, uh, which is therefore you have to have a special approach for these guys. Um, and others uh, just need more information. So I hope something like a lecture like this can be condensed into posters or documents with evidence and referencing and referencing and referencing to show them that yes, there's a possibility that will help you. Um, you have to address this in a non-confrontational -confront and an empathetic manner. I must admit, I have lost my patience, so I'm not very really empathetic, nor am I very non-confrontational. And I have a tendency of people, you know, especially intelligent people who are, who are sort of, if you like, a professional class, not being able to understand the concepts. Uh, I, I have find it very difficult to understand that. 
but you have to give them reliable information and give them uh, and try and explain to them what the problems are. Um, this may not be sufficient to, to, encounter, to counter it, but at least you can actually give you evidence of your own decisions to be vaccinated, your family being vaccinated, and of course other individuals. And we know now that from the publications from the United States that 97% of people who've been admitted to hospital who have landed up in intensive care unit and who have died, 97% of them were not vaccinated. So that's quite a clear story for you. So what do we not know? Well, we don't know when we're going to get a booster. What's the transmission with the new variants? Is there going to be another new variant? Are we going to have to carry on, you know, like the influenza virus, uh, influenza vaccine changing every year? We have to carry on with the safety assessments, comprehensive surveillance where we can, and de determine effectiveness. And this is because of this. Because once you've got exposure, you've got asymptomatic, this is the bit that we're trying to protect against. The protection against severe disease and mortality is the most important endpoint, okay? So the bottom line is to stop the pandemic, you vaccinate, and of course the three Cs, where you close contact, avoid it, crowded areas avoid it, close spaces avoid it, and please carry on wearing a mask, hand hygiene, and so on. So the Nature paper, which was an excellent one, looked at the odds the reduced the odds of individuals testing positive um, after uh, uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. The greatest reduction in new infections was noted if you had a CT value of less than uh, 30. Uh, There's a reduction afforded by vaccination in people who are not vaccinated. And this was very, very dramatic. Protection effect of vaccine was more pronounced in people under that, as I said, self-reporting. And there was no evidence of any difference in the effectiveness between the two vaccines that were used in the UK at the time and the United States, they observed a greater reduction in new infections in those aged more than 75 versus those under 75 after one dose. But this difference was not apparent after two doses, okay? So what I want to show you is that in South Africa, there is this website that anybody can go to. We use it a lot. It's got all the information we need about vaccine, how to register, whatever you want to do, plus all the other bits that go with it. Stats from South Africa are very clear. We have confirmed cases of a daily average of 11,008. You know this already. Mortality rate has gone up a bit. Okay, vaccination of the population, at least one dose, 8.3%. Fully vaccinated, less than 4%. And we know that there has been a big problem with the availability of vaccine. Really, really a big problem. And now that it's being released and the people have stopped hoarding in the high income countries, well, maybe we'll get some vaccine. One of the countries that shall remain nameless had five times its total population, total population of vaccine, of, of doses of vaccine being stored away. So let's hope that one day they'll manage to pass it out. These are the approved vaccines, which is Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, J&J, &J, and now we're looking at the Sinopharm one, the, the COVID, the Bharat one has been withdrawn, uh, Sputnik uh, is there, and some of the others coming along. This document came out today. Well, in fact, yeah, well, yesterday, I think. And this is a guidance on developing a national and deployment vaccination plan for COVID-19. And I thought it'd be very appropriate to show it to you because you guys need to see what is going on globally, particularly where you have got low testing in your country and where your level and your surveillance is not as good as some of the other countries. At least you can start looking at the national vaccination plan and rollout because even if whether you're positive or you're not positive, it doesn't really matter. You need to get vaccinated is the point. So basically my take home message to you is please get vaccinated, okay? And save the people you love, all right? Um, and this was a, 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 a lovely um, a little uh, poster that was put out by the Daily Maverick paper in, in South Africa, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So thank you very, very much. And I will stop sharing my screen if that's okay with you. I hope I haven't overshot my time. I have a bit, but not too much, I hope. Okay. Thank so, you very much, Prof. Um, okay. It was really great. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Wanda, and she will take us through the questions and answers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prof, and thanks, um, Dr. Deborah. I know that she's had to drop off uh, as we are simultaneously uh, doing a training. 
uh, for Zambia and Rwanda as well as Mozambique. Um, so we do have quite a number of questions, but a very short time. What I would try to do for you, Prof, is you had indicated some questions you wanted to answer live. Um, um, so I, we will start with those questions. Then I will circle back to uh, Prof Shade as well as um, Anna and Lizzie who are on this call. Um, so let's start off with this question that says that, what do we do if we notice an outbreak of COVID-19 in a unit, um, say a ward? So in this case, a healthcare facility, if we have an outbreak. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think the question came from Jacob. I think it's a good question. I think what you have to do is document it like you would any other outbreak. You have to make sure that everybody that's in contact will be tested like the protocol requires by the WHO. Um, you would obviously close down the unit in the sense that you don't want people from there traveling around to the other units because, until they haven't tested negative, okay? Particularly the healthcare workers. Um, and if, of course, they have had contact, you can keep them on the same ward um, because they've already been exposed. If they haven't, then they'll have to go home and get isolated and quarantine the 10-day isolation. Um, if they get sick, then of course, you'll have to admit them to hospital. At this brief as I can make it. It's a, it's a full lecture on its own though, but yeah. Okay. Lovely. Um, so um, colleagues, um, definitely, if this is something that um, we need to um, discuss, um, feel free to respond to our surveys and we can include them as topics to be addressed. The next question is really on how do you handle COVID-19 um, cases, places where there are no health services? Our colleagues from Somalia are highlighting that, um, especially in rural areas, they really do not have a mask. Uh, there's not even a dispensary. So in that case, how do we address it? And um, Prof, I want you to also look at this um, in the sense of um, primary healthcare units in remote settings. How do we really um, support healthcare workers there? Well, first of all, my first of all, my heart goes out to you. I really, really think that you know you guys are absolutely amazing to be able to try and deliver that. So what you're saying basically is there's no testing, but we have to consider. Um, if you like, symptomatic treatment of COVID. So anybody who comes in with a cough, cough and a cold and a fever will be considered COVID unless proven otherwise. That's the only way you can deal with it, unfortunately, even though they might have influenza or rhinovirus or something else. Okay, so that's the first thing. You're saying that you have no health facilities, but you do have space. If you have space, then you can start putting a designated space in, in, in a healthcare facility or even in a community hall or anywhere else. So you have a designated space where you have people who've got respiratory symptoms who are then actually allowed to be. Now, if you're not testing, it's really difficult to prove that the person has got COVID, okay, to be honest. As far as your protection is concerned, the simplest way is get a scarf. Now, I know in Sudan, you guys have lots of scarves because I bought some when I was there. So you put a scarf around your nose and your mouth. Okay, and wear a pair of glasses or sunglasses. And that is all you really need at the very basic level, because what you're trying to do is to protect. The forget about the visor and the and respirator and the who and the what and the why. That is for people that have actually got. I'm talking about a very simple way of making sure that you reduce the transmission to yourself. Now, you can't do the same to your patients because they actually can't breathe properly anyway. So the best thing to do is to protect healthcare workers if they haven't got a surgical mask or a respirator is to actually use a, a, a multi-layer cloth, something like this. It is, this one is not from the Sudan, but something like this would actually be quite effective, up to 70% effective in, in, in reducing transmission if you possibly can. Don't forget the hand hygiene, the, the social distancing, the huge ventilation issue, which you must deal with. You must make sure there's very, very good ventilation. Um, and then all you can do is to document it like that. I don't know whether, uh, one day, whether you want to make any point. I mean, we are going to be discussing some of these matters later with the CDC to see how we're going to deal with this matter. But it's a terrible um, issue that we need to probably address. I don't know if I've helped, but maybe Shade or Lizzie or one of the others can actually add to this. 
Yeah, I, I think that, that that is quite a practical um, approach to it. And, and indeed, um, um, unfortunately, we just need to be aware of health inequalities and equities are, across our continent. Um, I think speaking from the Africa CDC perspective, one of the things that we are keen on is to ensure that um, we have all of the 55 member states having adequate PPE to ensure that all healthcare workers, no matter where, what facility they are, have access to quality um, PPE to keep them protected, um, not just Africa CDC as well as WHO, but we do understand there are issues in country around distribution, means that we might be supplying, but it isn't adequately distributed. Um, this is some of the things that our logistics and supply chain team have been taking on. So I think um, uh, many of those issues will be addressed um, 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 uh, in the coming months. We are doing our best to ensure that all healthcare workers are protected. So I think I can move on. Can I just add one point, which I forgot to mention. As soon as you can, get as many people vaccinated as you can. As soon as you can. Okay. Forget about the fact that they've got an infection or whatever. Else. Just get as many people vaccinated as possible. All right. It's really, really important. Thank you. Sorry. Lovely. Thanks a lot. I think um, the next few questions, again, come to the... Um, come to the um, vaccination question. And, um, and this question is really, um, uh, again, to Africa CDC, I guess. It says um, just 2% of the continent and nearly um, 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 1 billion people have received one dose. Only um, um, uh, uh, like a 9 million Africans are fully vaccinated. Is there, are there plans for accelerating or facilitating COVID-19 vaccines to Africa in the coming months? Um, there's also a question, which I would just try to take both of them because of the time. How do we reach head immunity when there's an unequal distribution of vaccines across uh, the world. So uh, indeed, yes, um, many of us are aware that um, 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 there are definitely health inequalities and um, uh, vaccine equalities. Um, I'm looking at the global north versus the global south. I think I would just give you an idea of um, the work that we are doing as Africa Union and Africa CDC is that we are trying our best to ensure that all of our 55 member states have access to have access to um, um, vaccine, um, one through the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Tax Team, um, that's the AVAT, and as well as the COVAX. Um, you, if you follow our um, social media pages, you would see that um, very recently through the um, leadership of the Africa Union Commission, we have been able to at least um, to ensure that um, um, we can, um, 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 through the, um, 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 the, 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 the hub, the manufacturing hub in South Africa, for example, we, we in the coming months, we will be able to locally produce produce um, vaccines on the continent, or uh, maybe not produce, maybe repackage um, through the agreements that has been made. Um, we also want to highlight some of the bilateral donations that we have gotten um, from the US government as, as, as well as the European Union to ensure that um, um, we are able to cover at least, um, because the, the aim for us is really to achieve 60% herd immunity on our continent. We have a long way to go. This is why as soon as any vaccine is available to you as healthcare worker, as um, general public, family, loved ones, you must take the vaccine available to you. We always say this uh, as a joke that the best, the best vaccine is the um, vaccine available to you. So we are working um, day, day and night to ensure that we, we increase the access um, um, to vaccines, but also um, this is where your you have to play a role in addressing issues around vaccine hesitancy, um, in breaking those myths, um, addressing them with scientific evidence. This is the role of healthcare workers. We are working very hard to ensure that we have access, um, but there are also issues around are people coming forth to take the vaccine or not? And so this is where we need you as our foot soldiers. And that's why Prof. Shaheen has done a fantastic evidence um, um, synthesis and has shown you what you need to know. Um, now how you have the science to count the meat, and we're hoping that you take on the button and um, help us with this. Um, so I think I can also move on to some of the last questions. Uh, some of them, um, 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 Prof. Shaheen, um, some of them would be for you. Um, 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 is um, one, <laughs> if you get the disease, do you get a lifetime immunity? Um, also, um, 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 what is the current research around um, um, the prerequisites for um, um, to vaccinate individuals? I'm not sure I quite understand that question, um, but if, if you are able to take that on, um, I think it would unpack some of the other additional questions. Over to you, Prof. Shaheen. 
Thank you. Uh, basically, we don't know. We don't know what the immunity is. We think it's going to wane in two to three years. And we think that there's going to be a system in place very soon, which is because a lot of the longitudinal studies are looking at the neutralizing antibodies over a period of time. So those that were vaccinated this year, we will only know by the end of 2022, how much of that neutralizing antibody has remained, okay? So we don't know the answer to that. It's quite possible that we might need a booster every two years, every three years, we don't know. All we know is that at the moment, it'll stop the epidemic and it'll stop the pandemic as we sit, okay? So, so, so that was the first question. The, the second question, uh, sorry, one day I, I missed the second question. It was a very brief one. Uh, Monday, what I think I, I just I just moved the question to answered, so I must look for it now. But in the time being, since you already have your mic on, I will just throw this next question up at you: Is what are the recommendations for vaccine mixing? Um, I don't know if you, you uh, mentioned yeah. that in your in your. Yeah, yeah. In no, your no, that, it, it, it's an interesting one. It's particularly true for us in in Africa because sometimes we get from a donation, we get one type, and then we get another type, and then we get another type, and what are we doing with it? So the answer to that is that what has been suggested and it is not evidence-based but it has been suggested that if you've had one dose of an mrna vaccine you may have another dose of an mra vaccine if you've had one dose of an well then it's, that's only the astrazeneca which is the of course the the adeno uh, vector vaccine you will have two doses of that okay um, the Chinese vaccine has gone to the old fashioned way of making vaccines like the, they did in the old, year, in old days, where they would have the virus and they would attenuate it or semi kill it. Uh, so it had an antigenic structure, but was not able to give you disease. And we don't know whether that vaccine can be um, used against other vaccines. Okay, so at the moment, the way of thinking is, and I could be wrong, the way of thinking is this is up to about a week ago, that if you have run short of mRNA vaccines of a particular company, you can use another mRNA vaccine. And I think I showed you the figures from the outcome of when they gave um, the two vaccines together, what the impact of it would be. So hopefully that will work. So if you keep M mRNAs with mRNAs and, and adenos with adenos, then I think you probably would get away with it, yeah. Fantastic. So I do have a number of questions, which what I will do towards the end of this is I will let all of the speakers say at least one sentence in terms of if you were to convince anyone, if you were to lead um, some advocacy around the use of uh, vaccines and, and 